me just check to make sure that we have all the board members here. Um, I see Maureen and Robin and Jess and Tom, so we're all set. And um, I just want to start off today's meeting. Um, we're going to introduce the members of the board. Uh, my name is Kevin Mullen. I'm the chair and we'll go in alphabetical order. Hi, I'm Jessica Holmes. Um, I'm from Middlebury. I teach economics at Middlebury College and I've been on the board for six years. Hi everyone, I'm Robin Lund. Um, I live in Berlin and I've been on the board for four years and prior to this worked in various government settings on healthcare policy. Good morning everyone. Um, I'm Tom Pelham. Uh, I also live in Berlin but grew up in Arlington um, and I was the state's finance commissioner for a number of years and tax commissioner for a number of years and I've been on the board here come November three years. Hi, I'm Maureen Yusufer. I've been on the board a little bit over three years and um, my background has been uh, corporate finance, uh, CFO, and also on public and private boards. Maureen, you have a little film noir thing going. I know. <laughs> uh, the sun is like coming in right now and I'm like trying to pull the shades down. I'm in like my office in Burlington and it's, it should settle down. Well, it's better internet, so that's the most important thing. So um, we're going to start um, by just, uh, I want to remind everybody that the chat function is not a way to um, submit public comment, that after each hospital budget hearing, it, uh, there will be an opportunity for the public to comment on that uh, budget, and that would be the appropriate time to do so. So if you could please refrain from using the chat function, that would be great. Um, the first hospital today is Gifford, and Dan, are you all set? Good morning, Kevin. We are all set. So, Dan, um, if you could introduce each of the presenters for the court reporter and then raise everybody's uh, right hand so that she can swear you in. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Dan Bennett. I'm the CEO at Gifford, and the other presenter is Wayne Bennett. He's our interim CFO and no relation. But, uh, we are ready to swear in. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the evidence you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. I do. Thank you. And Dan, whenever you're ready, you can begin. And I do see that we have um, one of your local reps on the, the line as well. So uh, Representative Reed, welcome. We're always uh, happy when legislators take the time to um, attend any hearing of the Green Mountain Care Board. So thanks. thanks. And, uh, well, I, I wear two hats since I'm on the board of Gifford as well. So, OK, Dan, whenever you're ready. All right, great. So, um, uh, Kevin, if you can just uh, confirm with a thumbs up that uh, you can see the presentation on the screen. Okay, that's good. Great. So, uh, Wayne, if you want to go to the next slide. So, uh, today we are uh, going to be presenting all of the portions of uh, the budget presentation that were requested by the board. Um, we're going to do that in uh, three sections uh, as, as we go uh, forward today. The first uh, section we're going to cover is that we're going to provide information for the board on uh, what has transpired around our financial improvement plan that we've had in place now for a couple of years. That will take us on a timeline that will end uh, as of the end of February this year, um, which, as we all know, is uh, basically the time frame when um, we emerged into the pandemic. The second phase we're going to go through is uh, the pandemic to date. Uh, so we're going to give you information on what our strategy was as an organization for uh, making our way through the pandemic and then uh, give you an overview on the financial impact of the pandemic again to date. And then finally, of course, we're going to go into our presentation on our 2021 uh, budget. Uh, and the assumptions that we followed uh, to construct that budget. Uh, before I do that, I do want to just take a second and uh, thank the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, you made some, um, some changes to the process this year that um, were helpful given uh, what all of us were going through. 
Um, and uh, that's much appreciated on, on this side and I uh, just want to acknowledge that. And then also to uh, thank um, once again uh, the Green Mountain Care Board uh, Hospital Budget staff, Patrick, Lori, and the whole team for their work um, and their help as we uh, go through this process, but also um, throughout the year they're always um, uh, very available whenever we need them and uh, always uh, very helpful. So um, just wanted to say thank you uh, to all. I'll go to the next slide. So first off, just real briefly, um, an overview of the uh, corporate structure uh, here at Gifford. Um, as we've talked about in the past, we do have a unique uh, organizational structure in that um, our parent organization is a federally qualified health center. Um, we are one of uh, three organizations in the country that have this structure, the other being Springfield. Obviously, they're going through some changes right now. Um, but uh, we, it is a unique structure. So under the FQHC, um, which houses all of our primary care practices, we have Gifford Medical Center, which we're here to talk about today. Um, we are a 25-bed critical access hospital. Uh, our and our specialty physician practices fall under the hospital. Uh, our third, uh, the third leg of the Gifford stool is Gifford Retirement Community, which consists of our 30-bed nursing home and also our 49 apartment independent living facility. We also have a, an adult day program that we run um, uh, in, in Bethel, Vermont. So today, um, we're going to, uh, as, we move through the, um, as we move through our presentation, we are going to provide some, um, some key financial information at our system level, so at the level that includes all three organizations. Uh, we're going to do that in order to uh, better present our overall financial, the overall financial health of our organization. Um, but obviously, when we um, talk about the specific budget, we are talking specifically about Gifford Medical Center. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as uh, I presented um, to you on numerous occasions, uh, and as you're well aware, uh, Gifford has had some financial challenges over the last couple months. I'm um, sorry, over the last couple of years. Um, and we uh, devised a uh, three-part plan uh, for us to improve upon our finances um, and uh, started this uh, uh, in, uh, after fiscal year 17 into fiscal year 18. The three parts of that plan, first off, the first part was to return to our historic volumes. And this really focused uh, in, in, in large part around filling vacant positions and uh, the most uh, impactful from a, from a financial standpoint were vacancies in our orthopedic and general surgical areas. The second part of our plan was to uh, reduce cost. We uh, took many actions over the last uh, two or three years to improve our efficiency by reducing cost uh, throughout our organization. Finally, we have made a concerted effort to expand our community outreach and our partnerships throughout our community and with other uh, healthcare and social services organizations. Um, and uh, in order to serve our community, we need to know our community and we need to work with other parties uh, within our community to be successful. Uh, our efforts to date, uh, as we go up through the first part of our timeline to uh, from fiscal 18 into uh, the period that ended in February of 2020, our efforts were successful. Uh, we have achieved sustained profitability uh, up to the period that uh, we started the pandemic. Um, Wayne is going to now share with you um, some information on what that looks like, and I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Dan. Uh, this is a schedule that shows at a very high level the financial results for FY17 and 18 and 19, and then year-to-date through February, just prior to the pandemic. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is what led, at a, again, at a high level, <clears throat> what led to the losses in FY18 and then what had to be turned around so that we could recover. So uh, the highlighted yellow areas show the percent change in revenue and the percent change in expense compared to the prior year. So you can see that in FY18, Gifford Medical Center, the hospital, uh, had a $5.3 million loss from operations. Compared to the prior year, there was a 10% reduction in revenue. So a 10% reduction in revenue 
and a 2% decrease in expense uh, caused the gap of loss from operations. And at a system consolidated level, there was a $6.8 million loss in FY18 with a 5% decrease in revenue and actually a 0.6% increase in expense. So things were going in the wrong direction. Um, to improve on that in FY19, so to go from a $5.3 million loss in FY18 to only a $400,000 loss in FY19, revenues grew by 3% and expenses dropped by 6%. So uh, thoughtful efforts in uh, reducing the expenses uh, paid off and we saw significant improvement. You get a sense of what the uh, changes were to improve efficiency by looking at the FTE count. So in FY17, 341.7, uh, 340.5, pretty much the same in FY18, <clears throat> but then a significant decrease, about 4%, to 326.9. You know, uh, uh, salaries and benefits are about 60% of our total expenses, and so you really can improve efficiency or reduce expenses without reducing FTEs. Um, so the FTEs dropped by uh, a significant amount down to 326. Um, so significant improvement between FY18 and 19, and then entering uh, FY20 for at least the first five months, we again had a significant increase in revenue. So uh, all the efforts that Dan was just describing of patient volume coming back uh, to where they were a couple of years before uh, resulted in a 10% increase in revenue at the hospital for that five-month period a 5% increase uh, at a system combined level with only a 2% increase in expenses. And so for the five months ending in February, for the you know, just before uh, the COVID pandemic, we actually were profitable from operations at both the hospital level and the system combined level. So at that point in time, we felt that we were really uh, on the right path and had made uh, really good decisions over the past couple of years to uh, improve patient uh, revenue and volume and uh, keep our expenses under control, and we're sitting in pretty good shape. Um, when we diagnose our overall financial health and we try to measure our overall financial health, we compare ourselves to some key financial ratios, uh, and we benchmark ourselves uh, to the Moody's BAA3 rating, which is sort of the entry level of uh, investment grade uh, hospitals. And so our goal is to always be better than these uh, benchmarks. And so there are eight specific benchmarks. Uh, they uh, measure uh, the areas of uh, profitability, uh, capital financing, uh, liquidity, and average age of plant, average age of uh, buildings, equipment, and technology. And you can see on this, uh, you know, green is better than the benchmark and red is worse than the benchmark. And even back in FY18, <laughs> when we had significant operating losses, uh, we still had fairly strong uh, cash reserves. So even back then, 164 days of cash on hand, 120% uh, more cash than debt, uh, and fairly low debt. Debt only represented 35% of our uh, equity. And so even back then, uh, the problem was really their earnings uh, and the day-to-day uh, -day cash flow more than it was our balance sheet strength. Um, and so even when we had the losses in FY18, uh, because our balance sheet was so strong from many years of really successful uh, financial results um, and good decisions made for a long time, because we were so strong at that point in time, we had the luxury of, of being thoughtful in developing the turnaround plan on a go-forward basis. Um, Back in FY18, though, you can start to see a troubling trend of the average age of plant. What's happening is uh, due to the losses uh, and the weaker earnings at that period, less money could be spent on capital expenditures, and you start to see a weakening of the average age of plant, so not enough being invested um, in the plant, particularly at the hospital side. Then you can see that it starts to improve in FY19, where the earnings ratios are a little bit better. Then when we get to the year-to-date February, the five months of this fiscal year, uh, all the ratios are green at both the system combined level and the hospital level, except again for the average age of plant. Um, so things had really turned around. Uh, we thought we were doing pretty well, and we started to discuss how to, you know, the next step was trying to improve the average age of plant ratio, starting to think about putting a little bit more of our 
cash and uh, cash positive cash flow into investments in capital. So um, that's where we're at that point. Like I said, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. Um, um, and then COVID arrived. <laughs> uh, and so uh, what was the impact of COVID arriving? So this is a graph that shows, uh, just to demonstrate this, uh, shows weekly charges. Uh, it starts back in the first week of January <clears throat> and goes right up until last week. We updated this this morning to go right up to uh, last week. And, and you can see that as soon as we entered into the period of social distancing and patient caution and the cancellation of elective procedures, the revenue uh, significantly drops immediately. So we were going right along in the first, you know, couple months of the, of the calendar year, averaging about $2.7 million of patient charges a week. And then it drops in half uh, in a three or four week period and bottoms out in around the fifth week, right about here. Um, at about 50% of our normal uh, business. And you can imagine the sleepless nights that were happening at that point in time where we really weren't sure uh, what uh, what was going to happen. You know, again, because of the strength of our balance sheet and our, our cash reserves, we were able, to, again, to have the luxury of being thoughtful in developing our action plan at that point in time, but we weren't really sure uh, what was going to happen. Um, Right about this same period of time, right about week five, right about the middle of April, we did start getting uh, COVID relief funds. So uh, that made us feel a little bit better. And we'll talk eventually about those COVID relief funds um, in a couple more slides. Um, but then you can see that things started to turn around as, as uh, uh, things opened back up again uh, and revenue started gradually coming back. Um, and this is important to you know, to talk about as we, when we get into our budget for next year, uh, we budgeted next year that patient violence would come back to the pre-COVID levels. Um, and we were feeling pretty confident about that as we were submitting our budget, which is right about here. And we actually were back for a couple of weeks. Um, lately, things have dropped off a little bit, um, but uh, we'll go back to this slide later on when we talk about developing our budget for next year. Um, I'll hand it back to Dan to review uh, our priorities as we began managing through the pandemic crisis. So as Wayne noted, when we came into the period, the, the pandemic period, um, what we've called here the, the COVID calamity, um, we, we had no uh, we had neither no expectation or no promise of any significant financial re uh, relief. Uh, from the federal government, state, um, what have you. Um, so at that time, uh, our leadership team sat down and came up with the priorities that we were going to follow uh, as we went through the pandemic to ensure that Gifford could be as strong as possible and that we could assist our community and in getting through this crisis. Um, we wanted to ensure that we acted strongly enough to uh, accomplish these goals, but we also wanted to ensure that we didn't overreact. Um, as Wayne noted, um, we were coming into this situation with some financial strength. Um, we had a good balance sheet. Our day's cash in hand was strong. So we knew that we could take a little bit of time to come up with a solid plan to assess what happened and then to adapt as we went through time. Um, so we wanted to use the time that was available to us to devise a good plan and implement it uh, appropriately. Uh, we came up with three broad areas that uh, we wanted to focus on. The first is that we were going to provide appropriate access to care for our community, uh, and we were going to communicate throughout this event uh, to our community, provide them with the information and resources that they needed. Uh, the second was that we wanted to make sure that we maintain a strong and well-supported workforce uh, throughout uh, this event and that when we emerged um, from this event, whenever that is, uh, that um, we have, uh, that our employees are able to continue to uh, come to work and do their job well and that they've been supported. Uh, 
And then finally, obviously, we wanted to ensure that we maintained our financial strength uh, throughout this event. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so some more specifics around that. Uh, on the first item, the access to care and, communi uh, and uh, communication with our uh, employees, I'm sorry, with our community, we wanted to ensure that um, our primary care offices remained uh, open for needed care. And that was a combination of continuing to provide some face-to-face -face services as appropriate, but also expanding our telehealth and our telephonic care. Um, one of our main goals here was that um, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that our community members, that our patients received care in the right setting. Uh, we, uh, we were expecting uh, at this point that we were going to be seeing a lot of COVID-19 patients in our emergency department. Uh, we were ramping up to be able to provide for uh, COVID-19 patients in our uh, inpatient units as well. Um, and we were planning for uh, surge capacity around those areas. So we wanted to make sure that people who had other health uh, issues or other health needs that they could be uh, they could receive care um, uh, outside of the emergency department or inpatient settings and that they uh, didn't wind up there unnecessarily. Um, so we did ensure that uh, we provided care to our community um, by all means necessary. Uh, we also embarked upon um, uh, an expansive testing program. Um, we, uh, our testing program has obviously included people who are symptomatic or people who have had uh, actual or expected exposures to people, to other people who have uh, COVID-19. Um, we enacted a testing program uh, for our employees and also for uh, preoperative patients. Uh, more um, uh, since May, we've also been offering um, uh, community asymptomatic testing, uh, and more recently, we've been focusing on some high congregation testing, um, which is meant to um, represent um, schools, uh, colleges, um, churches, other areas where um, uh, people would be congregating in numbers. Uh, this program has been very successful. Uh, through Since May, we have uh, tested 3,900 people. Uh, I'll show you a, a graph after that, um, that visually represents that. Uh, but it's been a good program. It's been uh, very valuable um, to our community. Uh, it's been very valuable to Gifford as we've uh, gone through um, the first stages of the pandemic. We also focus very heavily on communication. Um, hopefully some of you have seen our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Josh White. Um, he has been... Um, uh, very um, prominent in uh, our communication strategy. Uh, he has uh, been blogging. Uh, he has been uh, speaking to local press. He's also been on some of the statewide uh, press uh, talking about the pandemic uh, and, frankly, providing very common sense um, uh, information on all things COVID to people uh, in our local community and throughout uh, Vermont. That's been something that we've wanted to focus on. We wanted to make sure that people in our community had the information they needed to be able to um, to be able to make it through this uh, pandemic uh, in this very um, uh, scary time. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we've done is to work with some of our partners to ensure that people in our community um, uh, had the basic needs um, uh, that they that they required throughout the pandemic. An example of that is the Veggie Van Gogh program. Uh, this is a program that we've been working with uh, the Vermont Food Bank uh, now for uh, over a year. Um, when we hit the uh, when we hit March and the pandemic uh, started, and there were a lot of changes and guidance coming from the from the governor and others, uh, we had to quickly adapt that program, um, which was uh, needed uh, even greater than it was prior to the pandemic. So we expanded uh, our program to do a uh, drive-through program. Um, we expanded sites. Uh, in addition to doing our Randolph program, we also uh, were able, with some community partners in the Rochester community, to we were able to expand it there as well. Uh, we utilized a drive-through format that allowed us to socially distance while also being able to uh, efficiently provide uh, needed uh, food to people in the community. 
And um, we've gone, um, we've seen a significant increase in numbers of people. We just did one this week. And again, we had uh, in excess of 500 families that we were able to, um, that we were able to um, uh, serve uh, with our program um, uh, this week. And that's been consistent uh, throughout the pandemic period. So this is a uh, visual representation of our testing program. Uh, the map on the left uh, shows you where, um, uh, visually on the map of Vermont, shows you where people uh, come from. I, I realize it's a little small, but um, uh, it does uh, represent that the, the greater number of the testing come from our service area. Um, the, darkest, uh, um, uh, the darkest block in there represents uh, the Randolph area. Uh, so that's where the majority of our people have come from. But we have serviced people from outside of our area as well. Uh, most of these people are people who are coming into our area for some purpose, travel, uh, work, or other uh, or otherwise. Um, but it has been uh, a very successful uh, program. Uh, this particular graphic that you have up here is um, a few weeks old. So, um, as I noted earlier, we've, um, uh, as of um, the beginning of this week, had tested 3,900 people. Um, we also have been able to mobilize to do a greater number. You'll see the on the far right the uh, test by service date that uh, we were able to mobilize on a couple of occasions to do um, wide-scale testing, and um, so we have had the uh, capacity to do that. I do want to note that um, we've done this in conjunction with our federally qualified health center, uh, which did receive some funding to help um, defray some of the cost of this. And um, that has been uh, a significant uh, benefit of uh, our structure and having an FQHC and uh, hospital working very closely together. Next slide, please. So uh, the second goal we had was to uh, ensure that we could maintain a strong and well-supported uh, workforce. Uh, as you all know from the work you did um, uh, over the last year, uh, headed up uh, by Robin on the um, the, the task force um, on, on on our workforce um, that focused uh, the task force on rural health, which had a large focus on workforce. Um, workforce issues were prominent prior to the pandemic, um, and it's only gotten uh, workforce has only uh, become a more uh, prominent issue um, with the pandemic. Um, our leadership team decided early on that um, we had to ensure that uh, our Gifford people would be safe, secure, and well-supported throughout the pandemic. Our first step in that was to ensure that uh, our people had access to the PPE, the personal protective equipment that they needed uh, in, order to, um, in order to see patients, in order to be able to come to work, the people who were able to come uh, to work physically. Uh, to ensure that they were protected. Um, and we also uh, quickly moved to uh, enhance our infection control protocols specific to COVID-19 um, so that, again, we could uh, ensure that there was a safe uh, workplace and a safe um, care environment for our patients. We also, once we hit the beginning of April, we offered a voluntary furlough program. I do want to stress this was voluntary. Um, and uh, as we um, moved through the first part of the pandemic, at one point we had about uh, nine, nine to ten percent of our total workforce uh, had chosen to take part of our in our uh, voluntary furlough program. We also offered um, work at work from home options for people, and quickly deployed the technology and training so that people uh, who were for whom it was applicable that they could work from home. Uh, we also redeployed staff to other areas uh, around Gifford um, first uh, as, we, um, as we planned for a surge, but then later on uh, to help fill in in other areas and to be able to uh, staff areas that we needed to stand up specifically because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, such as screening, uh, working in our testing program, uh, those areas. We also developed and then uh, adapted quarantine pay policies. Uh, if our employees were exposed to someone um, who had 
COVID-19 or if an employee should um, um, contract COVID-19. We had policies around um, uh, quarantine pay. So again, uh, they would be protected uh, in terms of their livelihood uh, should they be in that situation. We also spent a great deal of time and effort on communication internally. Um, one of the things we started up quickly was to uh, expand upon uh, our quarterly program for all staff meetings. Uh, we began doing that on a weekly basis, then a bi-weekly basis, and now we're doing it on a um, every three or four week uh, basis, doing video meetings uh, with our employees to inform them on what's going on, to give them clinical updates, to give them um, updates on our furlough program, uh, and other information that was pertinent to them at that time. We had very good participation by our employees utilizing the, the technology that was available. We also um, uh, utilized um, electronic communication with email updates, both clinical and administrative, and we stood up a phone information line as well that our employees could access to get up-to-date information. And then finally, we have applied for the uh, state uh, hazard pay program that um, uh, we had about 200 uh, employees that we deemed uh, to be eligible for that program. Next slide, please. The third area was uh, to ensure that we came through uh, the pandemic uh, retaining our uh, financial strength, um, and we focused on what we could do around uh, expense reductions and uh, cash flow preservation. Uh, I mentioned our voluntary uh, furlough program. Uh, at the height of that, we had 66 people representing about 44 full-time equivalent positions, or 9.5% of our workforce. Um, who took part in the furloughs. Um, that really was instrumental in our being able to reduce uh, expenses uh, in line with our reduced uh, volumes and revenues uh, that were apparent on the previous graph that Wayne had shared. Um, so that, um, um, that program was successful. Um, with the uh, expiration of the federal unemployment bump, the $600 a week program that the federal government put in, that expired at the end of July. Um, we have brought back virtually everyone uh, who was on furlough, um, and as Wayne illustrated on our uh, revenue graph, um, we have needed people because of uh, our volumes returning uh, back to uh, near normal, as well as having some additional areas that we need to staff, as I noted, our testing program and our screening program. Um, we also delayed our uh, annual wage increase program, which was scheduled to uh, take place uh, in April. Um, and then uh, from a cash flow standpoint, we did um, put on hold our women's uh, health renovation project, um, which uh, had started uh, up uh, prior to the pandemic. We did put that on hold, although we were able to restart that uh, in July as um, we started to see uh, our return to more um, more normal volumes. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Wayne to talk about um, the COVID uh, relief funds that we received. So despite the efforts that Dan just described, you know, we were able to, to reduce our costs a little bit uh, during the crisis, but certainly, you know, couldn't avoid the losses that were created from the really significant decrease in patient volume. So as that slide disclosed, we lost uh, $6.3 million between uh, March through uh, July, really. Um, but we were fortunate enough to get uh, quite a bit of uh, relief funds. <clears throat> so uh, this slide shows the at the top level uh, what, what came into Gifford Medical Center and then what came into the FQHC and the retirement community. In total, we got $7.5 million of COVID relief payments. Uh, this does not include the uh, an additional $8.7 million of interest rate cash advances. So what's shown on this slide is the actual uh, grants uh, that came in, the actual funding that we got. Um, so 7.5 total uh, COVID relief from CARES Act funds, the rural stimulus funds, uh, and some payments that came in from the Vermont Medicaid retainer payments. Uh, that came into both the hospital and to the FQHC. So uh, the hospital had $5.2 million of operating losses uh, March through June. So at this point, there's only about $200,000 left uh, from this pot of money. 
that came in, we brought the rest to income. So we're reporting break even um, on our income statement uh, from March, uh, and we have July results all the way through July, with $200,000 remaining as we get into August. The FQHC uh, received $2.1 million of COBRA relief uh, and only had $1.1 million of losses in the period, and so still has a million dollars remaining of COBRA relief funds. Um, <clears throat> We did submit our financial information to the Health Care Provider Stabilization Grant, uh, and I've had some discussions with that office. We don't expect to receive any funds from that uh, because we didn't suffer losses in the period. Uh, we did think it was important to provide our information to them so that they knew what our situation was in case we need to apply in the second round of funding there um, if we have losses in the, in the next period after uh, July and August. Uh, we may need to apply that. We just want apply for that and we wanted to make sure that they knew what our situation was. Um, so uh, we were very fortunate um, to essentially get through the period uh, relatively unscathed financially. Uh, and that brings us right up to today. And so now in our presentation, we're going to transition to starting to discuss what our budget submission was for FY21. Uh, needless to say, the disruption and distortion from COVID uh, provided quite a challenge in trying to determine what to budget for next year. So I'll hand it back to Dan uh, before we go through the numbers, and uh, Dan can discuss our vision and outlook. Thank you, Wayne. So uh, as Wayne noted, um, there's a great deal of uncertainty uh, which has been in place uh, since March and uh, continues as we look forward uh, into the next year. Um, that being said, um, we do continue our work uh, in support of Vermont's uh, health care reform goals. Um, uh, as we've noted, um, we uh, have undertaken um, a lot of uh, successful efforts to reduce cost, uh, and those efforts continue. Uh, we also are continuing to invest uh, in our population health uh, programs, um, in working with our uh, providers and our practices, uh, on um, active care management, panel management, uh, working with partners in our communities on a number of initiatives uh, that are in keeping with Vermont's health care goals. And we will continue to do that uh, moving forward. Um, we are anticipating continuing uh, in the all payer model uh, with both the Medicaid program and with uh, the MVP um, shared savings program. Um, those are the two programs that we're currently participating in, and that is our plan uh, to continue those as well in uh, 2021. Uh, in the short term, we are going to continue uh, with, the, uh, with, with the goals that we set uh, to assist us in moving forward throughout the pandemic period, the three goals I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, we will continue also to uh, take the information and what we learned from uh, this period uh, to assist us in our planning as we move forward. Um, so that takes us uh, in the timeline that I talked about at the beginning from um, the period over the last couple of years through February and then uh, through the COVID uh, uh, period, COVID pandemic period up to now. Um, and uh, Wayne now is going to take us to the next step and talk about 2021 and the assumptions that we used to build our budget. Um, so to uh, to summarize, I guess the, our budget submission uh, includes uh, a slight reduction in net patient revenue. So this is the net patient revenue plus the fixed perspective payments. So we're budgeting next year 0.6 percent less than we budgeted in FY20. The left hand side of this shows our projected 20 against our budget 21 but doesn't really provide a meaningful comparison because the FY20 projected is very low because it includes the COVID period. You know, normally when we put a budget together, the current year provides a base for forecasting next year. Um, but we didn't really have a good base to go on this year. And so we had to make a critical decision early on in the budget planning process um, about what to use as a base. So what we decided to do, because we felt at the time in the middle of the COVID crisis that we really couldn't predict what was really going to happen, um, you know, 
over the 18 months after COVID. Um, and so we rolled everything back to February. So we used the five months ending February as our basis for projecting um, the next year. And because we were fairly close to budget in the five months ending February, we end up submitting a budget next year fairly close to the budget of last year. Um, we based our reimbursement rates on the actual data through June because we felt like the five month period of October through February wasn't enough of a baseline to look at that. And so the combination of uh, you know, rolling forward the volume and then looking at the reimbursement rates over a slightly longer period resulted in the numbers that you see on the screen. We do have a 4% rate increase uh, in our submission. That is an effective reimbursement rate of about 2%. So when we raise our prices 4%, uh, the commercial payers on average pay about 65% uh, of that. So our commer the impact to our commercial payers, we estimate is 2.5%, 2.4%, actually. Uh, our government reimbursement payers, Medicare and Medicaid on average, we estimated 1.8% of an impact to them. And our self-pay patients, we have about 5% of the population that has no insurance. The impact to them is 2%. We give an automatic discount to anybody that comes with no insurance at all of 50%. So the 4% price increase to the self-pay population is an impact to them of 2%. Uh, the weighted average of all that is about 2%. So our 4% price increase yields us about uh, $2 million of net revenue. Um, and all of that math results in a net revenue fixed perspective payment budget next year a little tiny bit less than what we submitted last year. Just to uh, explain, just to sort of demonstrate this a little bit further about our assumptions of volume. So this slide shows some key volumes uh, indicators uh, in these rows that are highlighted in yellow. So total patient census, total OR minutes per calendar day, total ED visits per calendar day. And you can see the trend so, for example, FY18, the inpatient acute census plus the swing bed census was 14.3. Um, in FY19, it was 13.7. And then the five months ending February, 13.8. So we were running right on budget, 13.8. So our budget next year is 13.8. We rolled it back to the February number. Uh, you know, this year it dropped to 12.5 because the census dropped so much during the COVID period. So we didn't want to use that as a base. We just rolled it back exactly precisely to what the volumes were pre-COVID. Um, you know, OR minutes per day, part of the reason we were doing so well uh, in the five months ending February is we had a, more surgery as we tried to get back to previous surgery volumes in the past and uh, recruited new surgeons. So. Uh, 328 minutes a day, we budgeted 328 minutes a day. 17.4 ER visits per day, 17.4 ER visits per day. So that's basically how we did it. Um, you know, when you go revisit this slide of, uh, of uh, patient charges per week, um, you know, like I said, when we were in this zone of, of this few weeks, we thought it looked pretty good and that things were really going to come back. Uh, Lately, they've been a little low, although we suspect that they're low in August because of uh, more and more vacations, vacations of our providers and vacations of our population. Uh, and so we think maybe this is low because of that and things will come back. Uh, you know, there's a question about whether there was a little pent up demand that was met in the July period and maybe that's going to drop off. But I guess at this point, we're feeling it's more likely that it was the vacation season and we think we will be back to normal. So we're feeling pretty good about our budget uh, submission at this point in terms of the patient volume. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to predict what's really going to happen. On a day-to-day -day basis, things change so much. So back to our summary of the budget, um, that we submitted an operating margin of 1.8%, again, with just 0.7%, uh, so budget to budget, 0.7% more uh, net revenue, 1.8% more operating expense. So on the operating expense, we basically 
did the similar thing to revenue. We went back to February and looked at the actual trailing 12 months of expenses in February, and we rolled those forward adjusted for inflation. Um, and that came up with 1.8% more than the budget of this year. I mean, again, we were pretty close to budget back in February. So, you know, taking those that experience and assuming it's going to repeat itself after the COVID epidemic with a little bit of inflation gets us pretty close to what we started with on the budget. So 1.8% more expenses. Um, so a smaller net operating income, 2.9% operating income last year, 1.8% this year. Uh, you know, given the strength of our financial ratios, we felt like that was okay to have an operating margin of 1.8%. Um, a total margin of 3.6%. You know, as as we demonstrated before, the organization has fairly strong uh, cash reserves that are invested in the market. So with a modest return in the market, we get a million dollars a year of non-operating revenue uh, to help with our bottom bottom line. Of, uh, so. So in summary, that's our results. Then going through the detailed income statements, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time going through these numbers in great detail. Um, uh, on the cash flow statement, um, you can see here, uh, it's a little bit hard to follow the budget FY21 cash flow statement because there's a big impact in here of the payback of the uh, interest-free loans that we got. So you see that in this line, $6.4 million. We project to end the year still owing $6.4 million, still holding on to that cash and owing it back, and then we pay it back next year. So although this appears as though there's $7.3 million of negative cash flow in the year, there's really only a million dollars or so of negative cash flow, and that's because we assumed a, 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 a larger capital budget spend of $4 million, which is that's about 1.7 times depreciation. Normally, that would be a little bit more than you would expect to spend in capital, but we're trying to improve that uh, average age of plant ratio that we talked about earlier. So if things go well uh, and we stay on budget, we'd like to spend a little bit more on capital, trying to improve our average age of plant. Um, I'll hand it back to Dan to talk about service line adjustments. Okay. So uh, the service line adjustments are one of the questions that were asked. Uh, we were asked to address uh, in the in the presentation. We are not planning any um, service line changes in 2021. As uh, I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, we have seen steady progress uh, in our uh, original improvement plans over the past two to three years, um, and we believe that our uh, current model uh, is solid. The budget that uh, Wayne just presented as well uh, builds upon those plans, and um, so uh, we are not uh, anticipating any changes uh, to our overall service lines uh, in the coming year. Moving to uh, risk and opportunities, um, uh, on this slide we focused obviously heavily on the pandemic. Um, uh, we are not uh, finished with this yet, and uh, obviously none of us can predict uh, how long it's going to be with us and what impact it's going to have uh, going forward. Uh, so that is the obvious risk that we have uh, at this point. Uh, as Wayne outlined, our, our budget uh, assumes that we are able to um, avoid the types of disruptions in care uh, and the sort of in the types of disruptions uh, to life that um, people experienced in that period, you know, March, primarily March through uh, June or March through May, um, that that won't repeat. Obviously, if it does repeat, um, uh, all of these assumptions um, uh, will need to change uh, moving forward and we'll have to take the same sort of actions we've taken uh, to date. I do want to focus a little bit on workforce. I, I noted that before. Um, coming into the pandemic period, uh, this was a difficult environment to uh, both retain and recruit uh, employees, uh, particularly in rural uh, communities uh, like ours. Um, so uh, we continue to have those same pressures. Uh, competitive, uh, this is a competitive uh, market for uh, employees. Uh, we have seen upward uh, pressure in uh, for for wages, 
Uh, obviously, with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are some other challenges that did not exist um, previously. Uh, this includes some additional child care issues. And I think uh, we could all agree that um, uh, there were greater needs uh, for uh, child care. Um, somebody, somebody could mute their, um, their phone or laptop, please. Um, uh, there, prior to the pandemic, um, we needed more uh, child care options in the state of Vermont, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, that has only gotten uh, more difficult uh, with the pandemic. Uh, add into that um, the uh, different plans for uh, kids going back to school and the impact that has on their parents who are our employees. Um, this causes a lot of additional uh, stressors uh, for people. and. Uh, we are concerned about the ability to be able to, uh, of our employees to be able to show up on a day-to-day -day basis with all these uh, things that they're dealing with. So those are, uh, I think, the biggest risks that we have uh, right now. Um, obviously, there's uh, environmental risk and um, uh, in the healthcare environment that we faced, and I think that have uh, been well discussed. Um, but um, we feel those are the the general risk that we face. Uh, for this budget year. And now back to Wayne. So uh, wrapping it up here with our capital budget plans. So uh, due to the uncertain environment, uh, we did not put any major capital projects into our planning for next year. We restricted our planning to just routine replacement of equipment and medical uh, mechanical systems uh, because we wanted to be flexible uh, should uh, uh, we need to sort of shut down again. Uh, you know, this year we were in halfway through a construction project that we had to put on hold, and so we don't want to be in that situation next year. We want to have the flexibility of stopping our capital spending if we need to, uh, 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 you know, uh, hold on to cash. Um, and so we're really just looking at routine replacement of basic uh, equipment and mechanical systems. Um, we just want to let you know, though, that we uh, – we, we are looking into trying to take some of the surplus grant funds, COVID relief grant funds that the FQHC got, and perhaps invest in uh, expanding our broadband capability to support telemedicine a little bit better um, uh, uh, for the future. Um, so that wraps up our presentation, and we'll uh, open it up to questions. I think you're muted, Kevin. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. thank you. <laughs> Before I turn it over to uh, board member Lunge, I just wanted to uh, say that, um, you know, two years ago, uh, if, if anyone had asked um, who would be the biggest fear after the, the Springfield uh, debacle, it would have been Gifford uh, based on your um, operating losses that year. And I think that um, you and everyone at Gifford is really focused on um, keeping your organization alive and healthy for the long term. And your efforts are paying off. And I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that before we started our question. So keep up the great work. And we'll start with board member Lunge. Thank you. Hi. Uh Good morning. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your hard work and dedication during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we very much want to recognize um, just the lengths that all our healthcare providers had to go to, including all of your staff members who uh, continued to come to work in face of the pandemic and do what they needed to do for their community. So thank you. Um, thank you. In your narrative, um, you mentioned that you are starting to do some short and long-term strategic planning, um, both related to COVID, but also uh, entering into a longer-term strategic planning process. Um, as you know, the board has been working on sustainability planning with hospitals to try and um, figure out a path to move forward there. How can uh, our sustainability planning that we are doing together and your strategic planning um, work together to really incorporate 
um, that kind of thinking into um, your community strategic planning process? That's a good question. Um, thank you. Um, thought I'd uh, start so out I with think, a bang, you know? Yeah. <laughs> softball. <laughs> yeah, so much for the softball question, but, uh, <laughs> but no, obviously that's something that uh, I know um, uh, the board, uh, your the, the Green Mountain Care Board is um, wrestling with, um, and we obviously are uh, trying to make that connection on how we're going to uh, go through this process, which, you know, I think is still in development um, uh, with you and do appreciate your uh, keeping the lines of communication open uh, as um, you do your planning around that process uh, and including the hospitals in that. Um, you know, I think um, I think my first comment would be is um, uh, I, th I think similar to what you're saying is that um, the process that the Green Mountain Care Board goes through um, should not be duplicative to what um, our organization um, uh, does for strategic planning and the responsibilities of our uh, of our board of directors around their governance, uh, their governance of Gifford. Um, um, you know, as you're well aware, and you've heard from uh, from us, and you've heard from other uh, hospitals, um, we're stretched a bit thin right now, um, and uh, taking on another um, um, large scale project while we're dealing with all these things uh, that we're dealing with, in addition to the normal. Um, um, the normal work of, uh, of of running a hospital, taking on an additional task like that is difficult at this time. So we do appreciate your flexibility around that. Um, so I think um, uh, you know the work that um, you know the work that you're talking about is the work that the board and uh, our organization does. Uh, sustainability is something that we look at, looking at what services we're providing, matching that up to a community health needs assessment, matching that up to the demographics of our community, which uh, tends to trend to more of an older population, um, tends to uh, have transportation challenges, some geographically based, but also based on socioeconomic factors uh, in our communities. Um, we look at all those things, um, and in our strategic planning process, we try to match that up to what the, the needs are in the community with what we should do as a community hospital. I think we do that very well. I don't think that we have um, services that go outside what a uh, small community hospital like Gifford should be doing. Um, we, don't, um, we don't try to do things that we shouldn't do here. Um, we provide the services that we can support, and it's not just as much, it's not only having uh, a physician or a surgeon who's skilled in a particular area, but do we have the support uh, around them? Do we have the capacity in our nursing staff? Do we have the ancillary staff? Do we have the equipment? Um, can we afford to be doing these things? We look at all of that. So I think there is consistency um, uh, with. Uh, the strategic planning process with the governance. Um, again, I would, um, you know, I guess my plea would be to, um, uh, you know, to not duplicate uh, that process as we go forward, because um, we are doing that. And, you know, my assumption is that the other hospitals are doing that as well. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> that was thank my you. comment. Yeah, no, thank you. You did. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your reimbursement assumptions for 2021. Um, I know you said you looked at the actual data for how reimbursements were trending. Did you um, make any um, assumptions around changes in Medicaid prices or Medicare reimbursement? And related to that, um, did you factor in any of the temporary changes uh, removing sequestration? for Medicare? Uh, yeah, so our, our basic assumption of government payers, Medicare and Medicaid, was that they would increase their rates 1.8%. Uh, okay. You know, with Medicare, we're cost reimbursed. So yeah. the reimbursement goes up and down when our costs go up and down. So we had a little bit of inflation there in cost. So that was the initial basic assumption on Medicare and Medicaid. 
But then we also assumed that we'd have more Medicaid patients enrolled in the ACEO, and we are getting reimbursed less for that. So then, you know, so it went like up 1.8, but then down a significant amount with more people enrolled in the ACO. Uh, on the sequestration, we did assume that sequestration would still be in place next fiscal year. Uh, in FY19, the effect of sequestration was $234,000. So it's not, doesn't move the not needle huge. a lot, whether it's yeah. in or out. Um, but yeah. we, because we rolled forward from the past and it was in the past, it's in the budget. So that was our right. basic assumptions. Okay, thank you. Um, I was interested in um, hearing a little bit more about your telehealth experience. Um, it, in particular, I mean, obviously it's, you know, the FQHC would have the primary care component of that, but I was interested to hear, um, do you have a sense of percentage of visits in different settings that were happening by telehealth? Has that started to go back down with the reopening? Um, what do you expect moving forward? Um, so I'll, I'll start there. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so we, we did see a significant jump. Uh, so, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to, this is going to include both, um, video telehealth as well as telephonic. Um, but we went up as high as about a third of our, um, our visits went to, um, um, we're in those those uh, media, um, so telephone or uh, video um, uh, appointments with with patients. Um, that did uh, that has uh, gone down uh, since. That was at the peak of it. Um, we did have to do. Um, it, it took us a little while to get to that uh, to that level with um, being able to um, expand the technology and all. Um, so uh, that has gone. Actually, it's gone quite well, as I um, as I noted before. Our uh, one of our pieces of our strategy around our community was uh, we wanted to ensure there was access to care, but we also wanted to uh, do what we could to ensure that people weren't coming into a care environment where their potential to be exposed to somebody with COVID-19 would increase. And so this technology helped us uh, immensely with that. Um, we are continuing to explore um, how we make this more of a long-term part of our um, of our um, care environment, um, and so uh, one of the um, one of the positive things that came out of that, and that will impact our strategic planning going forward, is that we now have uh, uh, greater numbers of um, providers who now have some experience in using this, and uh, hopefully a greater comfort level in using this. Um, and how to introduce it to patients, um, how to ensure that uh, patients are comfortable with it. So that's been a good thing, and we will, um, uh, you know, we have, we, we will be setting some goals on um, what component of our overall um, uh, encounters will be done uh, by these means. We haven't set that yet, but we are working on that, um, and we'll continue to ensure that we have the technological um, uh, infrastructure to support that. Great. Um, and did you find, I would kind of make a guess based on your catchment area and some of the rural uh, areas within it that um, some of the patients, the phone was really the more realistic medium given their broadband or lack thereof issues. Did, is that an, a good assumption? That very much is a good assumption, yes. And we support all the efforts uh, in the legislature with the administration and also on the federal level to expand broadband to rural areas. That obviously uh, has a an economic impact, but we can see where it has an impact on someone's uh, well-being as well. Okay, great. Um, what would you attribute uh, your success in, in the quick implementation of telehealth to? Do you have any lessons learned or things that you think are worth sharing with other folks? Um, well, listen, again, boy, you're, you're getting the, uh, the questions I didn't prepare for, Robin. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But I, I think you I've know, been asking think, the same question, so I'm I'm sorry oh, that whoever that should be telling you this in advance so that you're prepared to know. All right, so you just you just uh, showed that I wasn't as attentive on the other hearings <laughs> as I should have been. Okay. Um, so um, I, you know, I think part of it is is uh, you know we are uh, um, one of the benefits of being a small organization like this is that uh, we are flexible, we are nimble. Um, we uh, were able to get uh, people, uh, you know, get our IT people in front of our clinical people, be there at the elbow to get them established. Um, so I think that that was, um, that was very helpful. Um, we did have, I think, um, probably uh, from what I've heard from some of the other hospitals and some of the other FQHCs, I do think we had a greater number of people who were physically coming in to work. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and at least at the onset um, of the pandemic, that did allow us to get people together so that they could trial um, trial the technology here. Um, um, and again, this was something that a number of people had not done previously. Yeah. So, um, so that was a good. Um, I think good leadership as well on both our uh, medical and our uh, practice administrative. Um, a structure was um, uh, imperative here as well as on our IT uh, side. So again, it's just a good alignment. Um, I would go back and just in general, um, the ability that we've had over the past couple of years to make positive change, to get people to embrace change, um, having that be a part of our culture um, helps to deal with these kind of crises when they come up. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, if I can just put in a plug, um, um, every single person at Gifford um, pulled their weight and then some throughout um, to this stage of the pandemic. And um, just I can't say enough wonderful things for our team. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the status of travelers. We have seen with some hospitals that the, they were able to decrease their number of travelers over the course of the pandemic. So I was wondering kind of where you were at before, what happened over the the last few months and what you're expecting for 2021. So it's, um, you know, like some of the graphs that Wayne showed, it goes up and down. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we, uh, we've we seen, particularly on the provider side, we've seen um, improvement. Um, so uh, as we've been able to fill some of our vacant positions over time, um, we've transitioned more from having uh, locum physicians be here on a um, what looks like more of a permanent basis. We've been able to reduce that significantly um, and where we are utilizing them in uh, some cases it's more just for uh, periodic call coverage um, uh, which is um, fairly routine in a rural environment, in a small hospital environment like ours. Um, we do continue to see on the nursing side, particularly with the OR, um, uh, that that's something that um, is a pressure that uh, we feel. Um, you know, when I talk yeah. about the work workforce um, uh, concerns we've had, a lot of it's been um, uh, regarding the OR, uh, our uh, nursing and uh, surgical um, uh, tech uh, positions there. Um, so we have seen um, um, we get that back almost to full staff, and then we have needs that arise. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be a continuing issue into 21. Okay. And, again, the child care issues, the, um, yeah. the, the, the back-to-school issues only exacerbate that. And so how many travelers? Small. It's, it's only Sorry. two to three. The, the okay. nursing numbers are remarkably small. It's two to three in the OR at any given time. Right now there's three. Okay, great. Yeah, I was going to ask you what numbers you budgeted for travelers. So it sounds like it's a small level. Yeah. Yeah. Two and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, uh, and then my last question was, um, well, I have two. So the first is it looked like, so you mentioned that you pushed off your um, salary and merit market uh, based changes from 2020, do you have that same assumption in 2021, a 3% wage increase? We do have that, yes. Okay, great. And then um, we, uh, did you, can you give us the information on what you budgeted for ACO dues and your risk? If you don't have that handy, you can submit that, you can follow up with that. Yeah, I don't have that handy. 
So we'll, okay. we'll, have that. we'll, we'll take it as a follow up. Great, thank you. I will pass it to the next. Thank, thank you. you, Robin. Next, we're going to move to board member Pelham. Tom. So my name is next. Um, good morning. Um, I, I want to uh, you know add my applause to Kevin's uh, in terms of uh, when I first came on the board, um, your uh, declining financial situation became very present. And I remember looking at lists of reductions that were as small as one hundred dollars. And I thought these people, you know, are going to be OK. Um, it's you know, there were no excuses. Um, and obviously we're seeing the result of that now that um, you are on much more stable footing. Uh, and I applaud you for that because um, I know how difficult it is. I mean, it, th those those are very difficult things to do. Um, so my first question has to do with fixed prospect of payments in that you're looking at a 14.2 percent in the 2021 budget over 2020, um, which is still only 6.1 percent of your uh, NPR FPP. And so I'm, I noticed that you were appointed to the ACO board um, in 2019, I think April of 2019. And I'm just wondering now when in wearing both hats, um, how, uh, how you would see and at what pace do you see the continued integration of Gifford with, with OneCare? Thank you. Yes. Um, so we are, um, you know, we are con and continue to be um, uh, very much supportive of uh, the health uh, the health reform effort. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Know, you know, just, oh, just somebody just needs to mute. Back. Someone so needs we to kept mute. the travelers to help us get. So the, the someone's people. having kind of a rowdy uh, uh, conversation there. If they could put themselves on mute so that we could actually hear what Dan is saying, it would be very helpful. Just for the record, that wasn't part of my answer. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we are um, we, we are committed to continuing our involvement in the in the all payer model. Really, for us, it comes down to a risk analysis, and um, uh, as as you noted, we've had uh, a rough patch the last couple of years. We've done taken a lot of efforts to improve upon that, and um, uh, you know, to this point. Um, uh, me, our leadership, and our board uh, have not felt that uh, we were at a point where we could take on the level of risk that we would need to to continue to expand uh, that participation uh, at this point. Um, obviously, the pandemic has um, only amplified that um, uh, in the activities and the, just the, um, the whole unrest around what's going to happen moving forward. Um, so um, that's where we are right now. That being said, um, you know we are um, investing in the activities that we think will make us successful in a um, in a population health, value-based purchasing uh, type environment going forward. We will continue to do that. Um, we think that our structure as a federally qualified health center and a hospital um, uh, that that structure um, will be beneficial over the long term uh, as we continue to make investments, um, uh, you know, in this uh, in this reform uh, effort. Um, uh, it is. I will just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get on the soapbox a little bit uh, since you gave me the opportunity. That um, you know, I do think that it's important that um, the state and uh, continue to uh, invest in. Um, in healthcare reform, uh, there were um, delivery system reform dollars that were in the original plan. Some of a, a very small amount of that has been appropriated, but the vast majority of it has not, which then has um, resulted in uh, hospitals uh, having to pay uh, much larger dues than we would have otherwise to invest in the activities that will make us successful, the whole system successful uh, in this environment. So that as well is an impediment, particularly for small um, small hospitals uh, like Gifford, um, to make the more rapid move into uh, this program. Thank you for that answer. Um, my next uh, area of is uh, having to do with bad debt and free care. And um, on a kind of a combined basis, uh, Gifford's bad debt and free care are projected to grow budget to budget by 36%. And if you look at it going back to 2019, it's a 50% increase 
you know, over your 2019 actuals. And that stands out a bit to me. Um, the system-wide average is, is a, you know, budget to budget is a 13.1% uh, a growth rate. So I'm wondering, and it's, you know, the increase that you're looking at is 1.3, 1.4 million, you know, over the 2019 actual. So I'm just wondering what you see that might be uh, driving the increase in combined free care and bad debt you know, over the last two years at the, at the pace that we're, 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 you're showing. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to compare to the 2019 actual because those numbers are a little bit depressed because of the volume in COVID, but uh, we're like everybody else. Hmm? That was 2020. Oh, yeah, the 2020 projected. Yeah. I, I, jumped, yeah. I jumped over the 2020 yeah, yeah. projected. <laughs> yeah, 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 the 2020 projected. Um, but we are seeing growth in bad debt just like everybody else related to higher out-of-pockets. Um, you know, the, the co-pays and deductibles that people have. So we do see that as a little bit of a trend. Uh, we're trying to give away a little bit more free care. Uh, we simplified our process for um, applying for it, um, and we're trying to screen people um, to qualify because those numbers seem a little low to us when we benchmark to the, you know, the rest of the industry. So we've expanded that a little bit. Um, but other than that, I, I can't really explain the growth other than sort of what's happening economically mm -hmm. around the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next area is the provider tax. Uh, this isn't a, a huge amount of money, but um, I'm, I was looking at your uh, 2020, uh, the, the provider tax related to 2019, and it was just about 6%. And what you budgeted in 2021 relative to 2020 projected is a 6.6% uh, increase in the provider tax. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you're hoping that there's a little bit of a cushion in that projection, um, uh, or do you expect it to actually grow to by 6.6% or, or, or to 6.6% yeah. of, of the 2020 projection? The, the budget... The budget submission for provider taxes is a zero-based yeah. budget. We know that number because the state has told us what it's going to be. Um, and so that's that's done fairly precisely. Um, you know, that it's a function of our net revenue. So as, you know, as revenue grew, the tax, the tax grew. So let me just understand what you're saying. So you were saying that you're, in your 2021 budget, the number you have there is one, is a number that the state has told you you will be assessed. Yeah, the FY21 budget's a known number. A known number. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I was going to ask a question about Medicaid, and uh, Robin started it. And as I listened to you talk, there's so many moving parts in terms of your your Medicaid uh, projection in terms of attribution. Uh, it looks like you're you know accruing some from the rate, or you're expecting some from the rate and uh, charge increase, um, the payer mix differentials. And so it's too much to unpack here. But I, I, I will make a point that uh, last week when DIVA submitted its budget to the legislature, they announced that the 2021 rates will not increase unless it's a federally mandated increase. Does that change your Medicaid? Does that pronouncement change your Medicaid projection at all? Uh, well, it probably would a little bit. But, you know, a significant portion of our Medicaid book of business is in the ACO part of it. Um, and so the rate increase that they're talking about affects a fairly small percentage of our overall payer mix. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every assumption in the budget, yeah. you know, is subject to change. I mean, overall. It would have a little bit of an effect, yeah. Yeah. I mean, overall, yeah. you're projecting whether whether you look at the budget to budget, you were looking at a 16.2% decrease in Medicaid. And I think on your approach to uh, the 2020 uh, being based on, on the five-month period, uh, you were down to a 12% decrease in Medicaid. Um, that's what's in your narrative. So that, that's a big drop. And uh, um, I wish we didn't have to talk about it, but you know that yeah. seems to that seems to be the the method of the cost shift. I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at your uh, 2020 uh, non-operating revenue, and um, you uh, it, it's it's a one point I, 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 for for it's a one point uh, four million dollar increase 
over the 2020 budget. And you uh, said in your narrative that there was a single $400,000 uh, contribution, you know, that kind of affected that. But that still leaves a million dollar increase uh, budget budget to budget. And I'm wondering if you can address that that million dollars as well. Yeah. So we have a you know, $30 million investment uh, portfolio where our cash is. And so there was a significant market gains um, mm -hmm. in the year that we don't expect to repeat next year, and we wouldn't budget for that. And that market changes in the bank? Yeah. Okay. Um, and just in terms of your capital budget, um, uh, agent plant, um, $4 million that you may or may not get to do. Um, is there anything critical if you don't get to do it, any of your you know, uh, you know, normal replacement uh, uh, the decisions, if if they don't get done, what, what might be the con oper operational consequence for the hospital? Well, the consequence is that something breaks and we have to, you know, cancel surgeries, you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, what we what we plan to spend that $4 million on are, you know, IV pumps, scopes, those kinds of day-to-day -day pieces mm -hmm. of equipment that are getting older and, and could break. You know, they all have service contracts on them, but that's the kind of disruption we'd be talking about. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll pass you along to next. The next next. Thank you, thank you Tom. Next, we're moving to board member use for Maureen. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I too want to echo everything that you've done th through this pandemic and how you've managed um, your financials, both now and how you did pivot after some big changes that happened between 17 and 18 and, and the focus that you've had on, on costs. Um, so starting out with costs, can you talk about um, any cost saving programs that you currently are working with and, you know, kind of what your long term strategy is for, you know, keeping those costs down? So I'm going to I'm going to talk about process a little bit um, and um, uh, please keep in mind that everything's um, you know, everything sort of been disrupted a little bit with the pandemic. but. Um, one of the things that um, uh, Wayne uh, has really done a nice job in uh, incorporating is putting process uh, to that very uh, goal that, um, that you're speaking about. What are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis to evaluate um, what we're spending money on? Um, you know, so we um, set up a structure whereby um, we were reviewing our labor costs uh, on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, looking at RFDs, looking at uh, and then um, uh, benchmarking them against what our volumes were in areas. You know, are we overstaffed? Are we understaffed? What do we need to be focused on? Uh, looking at our contracts um, with outside vendors, uh, our contracts for service uh, on equipment, all of those contracts on a regular basis. Um, we had a we have a we have an affinity group that's working specifically on that. Um, we have groups that's, uh, that's looking at our uh, supply cost, uh, our pharmaceutical cost, uh, medical supplies, uh, those areas, which obviously uh, has become um, uh, more of a heightened need beyond just cost, but around making sure that we have access to PPE and other equipment during the uh, pandemic. So we've developed a process to look at all these areas, and um, we've had some disruption in that over the last couple of months with people being out with the pandemic and all that, but we have that process in place to be looking at um, uh, what we spend money on, what we need to be spending money on, where we can be more efficient, um, how we can do things differently, um, looking at that on a regular basis. So it's that process that's going to continue to drive um, our ability to uh, become more efficient over time. Okay. Um, and one of the things we had allowed in this year's budget process was in your commercial rate ask to bifurcate it to a COVID ask and a kind of normal ongoing ask. So, you know, can you talk about, A, I guess, why you didn't use that option and B, you know, if you do have some incremental costs, uh, you know, just during your process, some of the things we've heard is, you know, it's, it's a little more time to prepare for patients. You know, people have actually hired screeners, things like that. So do you have incremental costs in your budget for 22 that were kind of a carryover for COVID? 
and uh, then adding to that why you know why didn't you choose to use uh, that option um, in your commercial ask we don't have anything in the budget uh, next year specifically related to new incremental COVID related costs you know like I was saying earlier we went back to the actual cost in February and rolled it forward um, the reality is that uh, uh, the incremental costs associated with COVID are fairly uh, immaterial. Uh, you know, we do have screeners at the front door, so that's a little bit of a cost. Um, there is a potentially an increase in basic med surge supplies, but if you really look at our med surge supply spend, it's a fairly small percentage of our overall spend that's in day-to-day -day med surge consumables. Um, I calculated at about 3% of our total spend 3% of our total expenses is day-to-day -day med surge supplies. So it would take a really significant increase in those med surge supplies to make a really big difference in our total expenses. So we didn't uh, attempt to try to guess what the impact on those costs would be and ask for an increase in our, our rate to cover it. Okay. Um, and we'll try to manage through it. Okay, great. At one area, um, I want to probe into a little bit more is your um, kind of gross to net as you look at um, uh, what you're asking for in 21 and specifically and I agree with you looking at 20 projection you know is not really the relevant number here so I'm going back to the 20 budget and you have an increase in gross revenue of seven million dollars from the 20 budget to the 21 budget. So you're going from 114 to 120. Yet what you're retaining on the net is, is you're actually declining. You're going from a 51.8 to a 51.5. And that's on top of a 4% commercial increase, 1.8% increase for Medicaid and Medicare. And looking at the percentages, it doesn't really look like you're having a big shift. Um, you know, when you, when you actually look at what you're projecting at the gross level, you're actually projecting your commercial uh, increase at, at the highest. So, so it doesn't look like you're having a pay or mix shift there. So uh, Tom touched on a little bit, an increase in bad debt would take some of that away, but that, that's only about a million three. So um, it, it seems to me there's, Quite a bit of conservatism in in that um, gross to net. You know, so it's your seven million increase on the top line, and and losing all of that. And you know, even if you compare it to where your twenty projection is, you're looking at an eighteen million dollar increase from twenty projection to budget, and you're only carrying about six million of that on NPR. So obviously, we know there's you know. We know you don't keep all that, but can you help reconcile that? Because um, I'm looking at maybe if you hit your gross number, you're probably a couple million dollar conservative in your um, in your top line. And I'll just add one thing that also then carries to what your expenses are, right? Because your expenses are growing faster than your NPR in your projection, uh, which makes sense when you tie it to the gross number, but not to NPR. So. Help me unpack that that seven million increase getting nothing um, at NPR. Yeah, so there are a you know multitude of factors in there. So part of it is that, like we said earlier, Medicare pays on the basis of cost, and so we don't yield as much from a price increase on the Medicare side. We're assuming that there'll be a, a higher number of patients on the Medicaid ACO <clears throat> for which we essentially are getting reimbursed less than a regular Medicaid patient. So that kind of erodes it a little bit too. Uh, we continue to see uh, declines in commercial reimbursement as a percent of charge, despite of the contracts that we have, the commercial payers are pushing back harder, uh, trying to disallow uh, charges. And so the yield is eroding a little bit. Um, and we factored all that into our projections. And you know, there's, I'm sure there's a little conservatism built in there too, yeah. But that's what we came up with when we ran all of our numbers. Yeah. Okay. Right, because you're, you know, when you actually go back to like 2019 to 2020, you were projecting a 4.7 million increase in gross and a 2.4 million increase in net. So, you know, it's to have 7 million on the top line and, and nothing on the bottom line um, doesn't seem realistic. I mean, I'm not 
too overly yeah. concerned. We don't know what's going to happen with COVID and, and everything. So my my um, my expectation on this one is, is maybe if that came through, that you really would end up with more in NPR and then a, a little bit stronger operating margin. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is just is just uh, cash flow and where your your operating cash seems to be ending um, for your projection. So it looks like from your 2020 budget, um, you had you were projecting about 241 days in cash. Um, obviously, you got a, a bunch of COVID money, which is great. Um, but as you now, you know, so I'm kind of skipping that piece of it, but in 2021 budget, it looks like you're now going to about 263 days and, and probably, um, you know, a lot stronger cash position, even as we exit 21. And just if you could talk to that a little bit. I guess if you agree with that and, and it, it seems like you're getting some care, you know, benefits uh, to cash from the money that you received for COVID. Uh, yeah, so in our cash flow projections at the end of next year, we don't hang on to any of that money. So right now there's $8 million of cash sitting in our bank account that we owe back to Medicare and Blue Cross, and that'll get paid back over the next six months. Um, and so it's a little confusing. You see all that cash in our balance sheet now, but then it goes away at the end of next year. But, you know, we we did start the year with about 160 days cash on hand. So I'm, I'm looking at the cash flow that was in, in some of the backup and it said that in your 2020 budget, your cash and investments was 3.6, 21, 20 projection is 13.6, get it, it includes a lot of um, yeah. one time, 21 budget is 6.2. So, um, and then from one of the charts you showed, I think it was on page 22, of your presentation, your operating cash, um, you know, it seemed to be netting up a couple million. I mean, that's okay. I'm, I'm just trying to look at, you know, where where do you think you're going to be when the dust settles and you pay back everything? It still seemed like you're going to be in a stronger cash position at the end of 21 than uh, where you would have trended without COVID, COVID money. Yeah, well, we had the big run up in the market at the beginning of the fiscal year in the first five months. Um, so, yeah, we, at, at February, right before COVID hit, we were stronger than where we were at the beginning of the year. And the market dipped way back down in the middle of COVID, then came all the way back again to now be worth more than it was in February. So the cash has come back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. I, I think uh, it's good for you guys to be in a strong position. We, we don't want to get to what was happening between 18 and 19. I just wanted to try to understand, you know, where things are settling out um, now. So, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we have board member Holmes. Jessica. Thank you. Um, and I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think it's very sincere from all of us, you know, thanking you for, you know, all of the preparations you made for the pandemic to ensure the safety of your community, the safety of your frontline workers, and the congratulations and a kudos for the turnarounds that we're seeing here. I think, you know, we all are sincere in those um, sentiments. Uh, no, you're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, and your presentation is very clear. I want to appreciate that. Um, and it's very obvious uh, from all of the budget presentations that we've had so far how much uncertainty there is and how difficult it must have been to create a budget for this year. I mean, I think we are all living in this unprecedented time of uncertainty. So I appreciated the clarity with which you made the assumptions and made those assumptions clear and, and built a budget that I think we all know may or may not materialize but not through any fault of any hospital, right? We just know things are happening um, beyond our control. So I, I just want to note my appreciation for that. Um, a lot of my questions have been answered. Thank you through the presentation or through other board member questions, but I do have a couple. Uh, you talked about the drop in FTEs as, as one of the biggest drivers of the cost savings that you've seen over the past few years. And I'm just wondering if those FTE drops were across the board or whether there was an area in particular that seemed high in FTEs? Are there any learnings that we might, um, that you might share with other hospitals going through a sustainability process that you've noted 
um, was an area where maybe there needed to be fewer FTEs or technology was, you know, replaced people, which is not always a good thing, but I appreciate that, you know, the cost savings you've made through FTE reductions. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I think first and foremost, I just want to note that, um, you know, the, the numbers there, um, you know, when you look at on the paper, uh, even me looking at the number year to year is, um, um, it's pretty telling. Um, however, um, we did do almost all of those uh, positions through attrition. So, um, yeah. you know, again, I talked about a process uh, to look at change, a process to evaluate what we do um, uh, in every aspect of what we do. And uh, that is something that we've done as positions have uh, become vacant. Um, and uh, a lot of those um, a lot of those changes and uh, reductions in staffing that we've had have been in, in administrative areas. Um, so we have um, done that in a way that um, we think does not impact uh, patient care. Um, and as we've um, um, as we've gone uh, through changes throughout our organization, we've looked at are there things that we can do more efficiently by utilizing technology. Um, by um, just embracing um, uh, uh, data-driven decision-making, those sort of things, um, and that really has uh, had an impact on, on how we operate um, and has allowed us to make a lot of these changes. Um, and uh, I don't think, I, I do think we run pretty thin at this point, um, but um, I, I don't think it's impacted our ability to um, provide the care needed in our community at a high level of quality. Okay. You know, one of the silver linings, if there are any of COVID, I'm not sure there are, but one of the silver linings perhaps that we've heard is that, you know, Vermont in many ways has become more appealing uh, as a place to move to, right? The real estate market seems to be having a little bit of a surge. People are looking to Vermont as a as a model, as a, as a place to take cover, all of those things. And I'm just wondering in terms of your workforce recruitment, has this been something that you've been able to take advantage of um, in terms of, you know, attracting new providers or new staff to the area as a Vermont as a safe haven from the pandemic? So I think anecdotally we've seen um, an uptick in some um, uh, some people applying for positions here um, who come from outside of Vermont. Um, I think it's a little too early to say it's a trend uh, for us anyway. Um, but it, it is a promising potential um, um, area for us in the recruitment side. So we will continue to look at that as we go forward and try to find ways to make sure if people are thinking of coming to Vermont, um, which all of us here know is the place that someone should live. Yeah. Um, but as people are making that decision, we want to make sure as well that um, Gifford is at the forefront of the places they're looking to make a living. Well, anecdotally, I was on a bike ride uh, and I bumped into literally two former students of mine that work in Boston. And uh, they've been telecommuting now for six months to their Boston offices and have just decided to, to relocate to Randolph area or somewhere around your neck of the woods. And so anecdotally, it does seem to be potentially um, a possible draw. So I'll put in a plug if they want to ride a bike, Randolph is the perfect place. Well, they were all in our bike gear actually, so th that's exactly how we met. <laughs> and I hadn't seen them in about five years, so it was quite fun. Um, so this is a you know, I mean, you probably are anticipated this question from me, Jan. So I'm going to ask it because uh, I wouldn't want to let you down. Um, but it's a it's a follow up to Robin's questions about strategic planning and sustainability planning. And I want you to know I have deep empathy for leaders of Vermont small hospitals. Right. Margins are falling. We're seeing that headwinds are growing. You face higher you know, fixed costs, declining populations, aging populations, shrinking public reimbursements, workforce shortages. I get it. I really do. And I'm wondering, I know that you're trying hard to balance the desire to keep services local, especially given the transportation barriers for vulnerable community members um, with the need to ensure that those services are low cost and high quality. So I'm just wondering if you can just talk a little bit more. We talked about this last year, but a little bit more this year in the eyes of, of sustainability planning. 
how do you balance this desire to provide local access, keep a margin, maintain quality with, you know, in some areas we've got declining populations, so your volumes are shrinking. So especially in your surgery area, where despite you talked about efforts in ortho and surgery to get those volumes up, there are some still some areas where your volumes are low. So how how do you what criteria do you use to make sure that it makes still makes sense for the hospital to provide that surgery versus say providing the transportation to a center that has higher volumes? How, how do you think about that in your strategic planning process? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to look at the interconnectedness of um, uh, all of the um, all of the services and all of the skill sets that are required to have a hospital that are required uh, in order to have a birthing program. Um, all of those things. Uh, we cannot have a birthing program if we don't have uh, a surgical program because we wouldn't be able to respond in an emergent situation to do a C-section. Um, we wouldn't be able to attract OBGYNs to come work in our community if we don't offer, if we're not able to provide uh, those level of services. So you have to understand the interconnectedness of that core that you need to provide. Um, and it's not, um, it's not valid to say that you can just split apart though all of those parts and look at them individually. You have to look at how one supports the other and what you need in order to build upon the services to ensure that you can um, remain a viable hospital. Um, we, what, one of our approaches and one of the things that I believe in strongly is that we can't sit here in a bubble in Randolph and say, we're going to do everything by ourselves. We're going to meet every need in the community and it's all going to be only Gifford doing that. Um, so we've looked out uh, uh, to other partner organizations and I've talked about this with you um, in the past, so you know this, but we work with Dartmouth Hitchcock um, to supply cardiology and some orthopedic services here at Gifford. We work with uh, Central Vermont Medical Center and the, and the UVM Health Network for um, chemotherapy, for pathology, for those services. We're looking at ways to expand our telehealth um, offerings so that um, we can be a base where someone can receive other services um, but not have to travel long distances. So we're looking at ways that uh, we can provide for our community, understanding that um, you know maybe we're not going to build upon uh, infrastructure in certain ways or um, uh, understanding that if we're using an orthopedic, or if we have an orthopedic surgeon from Dartmouth Hitchcock who's going to work here two days a week, um, you can't just look at the number of cases he does here at Gifford because he's doing a lot of cases at Dartmouth Hitchcock. So from the standpoint of quality and his skill set and the currentness of his skill set and the currentness of the technology that he can bring to bear, um, it's far greater than just what he does here at Gifford. Um, and um, uh, so it's all of those things that uh, we look at. Uh, and then obviously you have to do a financial um, analysis as well. And uh, again, but you have to do that financial analysis within the um, process of looking at the whole and what do we need in order to, uh, to be here viable. And uh, you know, we're going to go through that process. Uh, we're going to go through it internally um, you know, again, every time we do strategic planning to ensure that we can, um, we're providing services that should be provided here, we can do it as efficiently as possible and that the quality is going to be, um, uh, you know, at least as good as it is at other options that people could go to. And, um, you know, our leadership team will do that. We'll do work with our, um, with our medical staff and then ultimately our board will be responsible from the governance standpoint of, um, uh, deciding what our service rate will be long-term. Uh, you know, that's, that's how we do it. Um, with respect to the all-payer model and healthcare reform, I appreciated your investment, um, your commitment to the all-payer model and your investment in population health programs. Also respect the need for more healthcare delivery reform dollars. Um, and I understand that risk obviously was going to weigh into your decision about which programs to participate in. You're currently participating in Medicaid and the MVP program. My 
my uh, perspective or my recollection is that most hospitals that choose to participate in commercial tend to participate in both payers. And so I was curious about your decision to participate in one payers program, but not the other payers program. If you could talk about that. So our decision to participate in the MVP program, and we had originally, um, we're going to, I think when we talked last year um, for our budget hearing, we were in the process of preparing to participate with Cigna as well. So, uh, that did not come to fruition um, uh, between Cigna and OneCare. Um, so those were shared savings programs. So we did not assume risk in that. There was change in the Blue Cross program that occurred during this fiscal year I'm sorry, during this calendar year, for this calendar year, um, given when it occurred, given um, everything else we had going on, we did we chose not to jump in at that time. If that program were to continue as a shared savings program in 2021, we would consider it. Um, but the decision that we had reached for 2021 was that um, we were not in a situation at this point to assume um, significant risk, moving uh, additional uh, significant risk at this point. So that's that was the thought process we went through. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and kind of in a follow up to that question, many folks believe that you know it need, there needs to be a critical mass of a provider's panel or you know uh, the group of patients that a provider is overseeing that needs to be in an alternative payment program before you actually start to see delivery reform happen. So I'm just wondering how, uh, I believe you're committed to delivery reform and I believe that you're doing the population health investments. I'm wondering how do you um, work with your providers to get the boots on the ground delivery reform happening, given that you still have a very low percentage of fixed perspective payment in your NPR. So how do you kind of combat that Two foot, you know, foot in both canoes kind of the thing in terms of um, encouraging the kinds of reform efforts on the ground that we would love to see. So the um, I'm gonna. This isn't the right word, but the the tasks, I guess, or the programs that we put in place. We don't put them in place just for the um, uh, just for the populations for which we're in healthcare reform. We're building a system. Uh, we're implementing uh, care management programs. We're implementing um, uh, quality improvement programs around particular um, issues that uh, large groups of patients have. Uh, we're implementing panel management uh, programs. Uh, we're implementing those within our practices. We're not implementing them only for uh, the Medicaid population. So we're building out the uh, the capabilities to provide this on a wider um, for a wider population. So that's how we um, that's how we approach that. And um, again, that's part of the process that we need to go through um, in expansion is making sure that we have that infrastructure in place. Um, we've just um, in the past several months improved upon our own internal um, um, uh, data uh, analysis uh, capabilities. Uh, that's going to help us move forward in the future. And again, that's not, um, that won't be just one patient population. That'll be our ability to look at our, uh, our total patient uh, population and panel. And so uh, you know, we're, we're building that infrastructure. We're not building it only for those particular programs, but we're building it for our system of care so that we can um, implement it within our system of care and make those changes that we need to. So in some ways, you're building the infrastructure, and then as your financials get a little more sure footing as you're coming out of this, you may be able to take on more of the risk and do more of the alternative payment you know, methodology, but you'll already have the infrastructure in place for all patients in some sense. Right, I think you, know, you have the financial risk you have to um, um, you have to address. But if you don't have the capability to be successful in it, then uh, yeah. that financial risk is amplified. And I think that's you know exactly what you said: build the infrastructure and then be able to expand. That makes sense. My last question is a very very simple one. It's more of a curiosity than anything else, um, and it shows my ignorance and how average age of plant is determined. But on slide six, not knowing exactly how average uh, age of plant is calculated, this is just really a curiosity. But from fiscal 18 to fiscal 19, the average age of plant increased three years in one year. So I'm just kind of curious how. What is the 
computation there, and how do you have an average age of plant increase three years in one year? The ratio is net property plant and equipment divided by depreciation. Okay. So uh, it can be affected quite a bit by your depreciation going up or down. Got it. Uh, okay. <laughs> it can, and it can be de de uh, de uh, adjusted sometimes based on assets being retired and dropping off your balance sheet. Right. Okay. So Thank it's not you. a super precise number, but the direction of it is telling, I guess, so, you know, about yeah. where your plant's getting older. Yeah. That makes sense. It was just, it really was a curiosity. I was trying to figure out quickly as you guys were going through the slides how that might work. But I appreciate your answer. It makes a lot of sense to me. That's all I have. Thank you. And Thank kudos you. again. Thank you, Jessica. Wayne, um, in your presentation, you talked about um, how you calculated expenses for this year, and you talked about just using an inflation, inflation factor. And I'm curious, uh, which particular measurement of inflation did you use and what was the numeric value? Yeah, so we we used 3% uh, for salaries, 0% for benefits, 3% for supplies and drugs, and then 2% for all other expenses, except for interest depreciation and taxes, which were zero based. I came up with a, average, a weighted average of 2.4% for inflation which equates to about $1.3 million. So that's our assumption of inflation. Okay. Um, in your presentation, you talked about um, a uh, change in the way you factored in um, your revenues for commercial reimbursement because of um, denied um, claims. And I was curious if those denials were justified, if you've had to change the the way or the what you were billing, or um, are these just um, tough denials? Well, there's a couple of factors in there. The, the commercial payers are getting more aggressive about going in and looking at you know, the detailed bills and then challenging individual charges. And because a lot of our contracts are discounts off charges, so anything that they can go in and, and sort of strike from the bill causes them to reimburse us less. And they're kind of aggressive on supplies, actually. <clears throat> um, you know, if we can't document an individual supply was individually used and that individual patient, they try to kick it out. Um, uh, we've also uh, had an increase in denials just in our sort of billing processes. So we've tried to modernize our billing processes and try to eliminate those denials. So we've done quite a bit of improvement uh, in our revenue cycle processes, just trying to be more efficient with our billing. So hopefully that'll help us too. Okay. Tracy at North Country, um, it's going to be a little bit longer on this presentation. Maybe you could um, help us by stop sharing your screen. Okay, Wayne, um, you talked about uh, why you were, didn't believe that you were eligible for the state CRF funds. Have you applied for the FEMA funds that are available? Uh, no, I don't think that we did. We got so many other relief funds that we did not. And my last question is, what is the revised completion date for um, your woman's health project? We're expecting that that'll be uh, finished up in December with the ability to move the practice into there in uh, January. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't see anything in uh, um, your 21 budget, but obviously there's three months there that uh, um, it's there. Did I just miss it? It'll be a, that'll uh, the component that goes over will be um, in that four million. The vast majority of it will be in 2020, as we had budgeted in 2020. Okay. Those were the questions that I had. At this time, we're going to uh, move to the healthcare advocate. And again, if I could ask uh, Tracy at North Country if there's any way she could stop sharing her screen. Um, <laughs> we're trying to focus on Gifford. Um, great. Thank you. And um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'll add my voice of uh, appreciation and recognition for you and your team in responding to your community's needs and Vermonters' needs. I think it's really important uh, to to recognize it in the middle <clears throat> uh, in the middle of this hearing. Um, I also want to appreciate your answer to Tom Pelham's question about, about bad debt and free care. I think I heard you saying that you recognize that there was some bad debt on your uh, on your books that really could be or should be 
free care and that you ramped up some of your efforts um, uh, to help people apply or to uh, help in that application process. Could you say a little bit more about just what, what you did to accomplish that? Yeah. Um, it's actually an FQHC requirement that we screen mm -hmm. our patients when they come in. We're supposed to ask every patient once a year what their income level is to see if we can qualify them for free care. And as you can imagine, folks are somewhat reluctant to give us that information, so we're trying harder uh, uh, the way we talk about that when we talk about it with our patients to try to get the information. Uh, and we streamlined our overall process of application just to make the form a little bit simpler, to try to make it a little bit easier for people to apply. You know, we still base our free care on a percentage of federal poverty level guidelines. We really didn't change that. And we uh, think we're, uh, 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 have that level set at the sort of community standard of what the other hospitals have it set at. Um, but we're trying harder to, to make the process easier for people. Because, you know, when you look at our percentage of free care, again, our percentage of bad debt is a little bit low, and yeah. we would like to increase it a little bit. Yeah, well, again, thank you for your efforts on that. You you may know that we, the Healthcare Advocates Office, has put some energy into this in previous years, uh, but due to our, our own capacity focused on the, the larger hospitals, which you were not a in that set. Um, so I appreciate it. Um, I was very interested. I also want to echo what Member Holmes said about the um, clarity of your presentation. I've sat through a number of these and uh, I just want to say yours was particularly clear in both layout and description. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, on slide seven, I don't know if you can pull it up. Uh, I mean, I can get to it on my own cry. screen. <laughs> sweet cry. Yeah. Well, I'll ask away because I can get to it on my own screen. Um, I also found this slide particularly interesting in its clarity, but I, um, uh, I am, of course, curious about what the colors represent. I can make my guesses, but um, would if you were able to walk us through a uh, a description of, of at least the major ones that have changed. I would be interested in that. Yeah, the most dramatic one is the yellow one at the bottom, which is surgical services. So you can see a really sharp drop right away when we canceled our elective procedures, and you can you know you get a sense of the proportion of surgery uh, yeah. to the whole, uh, and it essentially disappeared except for really you know emergent procedures. So that's the surgical services. The one above that is the ER. And the ER dropped a little bit. Um, so you can see like some things drop more than others. Um, the red is inpatient, which declined a little bit, like particularly right here in the middle, uh, but then kind of came back to normal. Um, and the gray also looks ER. like it came down? Yeah, the gray includes physical therapy. So a lot of physical therapy was elective uh, during the period and patients really didn't want to come in. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of physical therapy in that. Um, the pink area here is pharmacy, so a lot of that is chemotherapy and infusion, which is relatively unaffected by COVID because if you need that, you really need that. But that fluctuates up and down even normally. You can see back here pre-COVID that fluctuates, and it fluctuates again. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay, thank you. That, that's, uh, that's helpful. Uh, and then lastly, um, I, I don't know if, you, if you've heard this or uh, if anyone's told you, I, I've been attempting to talk about race and, and uh, racial disparities uh, more in my day-to-day -day life, given the national and state uh, discussion and um, uh, recognition of this issue. And, um, and so I really wanted to invite you to talk for a minute about um, what you think the work is in front of a small hospital like yours in terms of recognizing um, and uh, addressing the, uh, the structural racism or the implicit bias uh, that's present in, um, here in Vermont, um, and it, whether you've taken any steps or whether you uh, plan to uh, take any steps on, on this area. So sure, I'd be happy to talk about it. And um, you, I have a board meeting tomorrow night, so um, my board members are going to um, uh, hear some information right now that they were supposed to hear tomorrow night. So, um, um, so Mike, I'll, 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 I'll give all of them your phone number so they can uh, uh, call you about uh, making me talk about this earlier. Um, 
But no, I'm happy to talk about it. So we, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that, um, uh, small statements that, um, that I made and others made uh, here at Gifford uh, over the last several months. Um, and then um, I, I mentioned in my presentation about our periodic um, all staff video meetings that we've had. So the last one we have, I uh, put out a, um, a request to our staff um, for people who are interested to volunteer to take part um, in an effort to ensure that Gifford is a welcoming environment. Um, and that is um, definitely um, in keeping with um, um, the, the issues of, um, of racial, um, uh, racial disparities uh, in, our, uh, in our culture, but also um, beyond that, um, what, are we, um, what are we doing to ensure that anybody who comes through our door feels welcome and is provided with um, the same level of um, care and treatment uh, when they come through our door? Uh, so there's, there's two things we're doing. One is um, I did get a group of volunteers who we're going to be sitting down, I'm going to be sitting down with um, a couple of uh, my leaders to do a focus group uh, mm -hmm. to identify what specific items we should be focused on dealing with here at Gifford to ensure, again, that we have that welcoming environment. So um, we're in the process now of setting up that initial meeting, and that'll take place in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the second thing we're doing is that we are actively researching implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. um, which we are going to begin uh, to roll that out um, with our leadership team, uh, which we are going to uh, extend uh, to our board members, which, again, they're hearing that for the first time right now. Um, and uh, we are then going to look at uh, um, uh, rolling that out with our medical staff and then figuring out where we take it from there, how we incorporate that into our employee uh, training, education, uh, continuing education, how we um, get that impl uh, implicit bias training uh, and um, acknowledgement and focus uh, throughout our organization. So that's where we are right now, Mike. Um, I feel that um, we're, um, um, we're, we have a good start, but we're only at the very, very beginning. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, but um, we are going to do that work. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Mike. At this point, we're going to open it up for public comment. If anyone would like to offer public comment on the Gifford uh, budget, this would be the appropriate time. So hearing none, again, I, I wish to uh, thank the uh, team at Gifford, the Bennett brothers, we won't say which one's older, um, for doing a, a superb job of, uh, you know, really uh, uh, communicating your budget and really your mission for your entire community forward. So at this time, we are going to um, take a brief um, bio recess. We will return at um, 1040 and commence with North Country. So see everyone again at 1040. Thank you all. Okay, thank you.